so thankful that the Lord is preparing us for heaven. Amen? And uh, God is so good to us in giving us his word and then helping us to grow and mature in his wonderful grace. Um, you know, each of us are called by God to be his children. And there is a process in salvation. When we come to know Jesus, we are not mature. But it takes a growing process to become what Jesus wants us to become. When we look at the children of Israel, we find them leaving Egypt. And what a glorious event that was for them to leave the slavery and the work and all those things behind. I liken that unto us coming to know Jesus as our personal Savior when he takes care of all our sin and our sorrow and our pain. And, and then we are called to walk in a walk of life of faith with Jesus. And all along the way, he calls us to trust him and follow him at his word. At any point in the walk with Jesus, we can say no to the Lord. And we, we incur the repercussions of that of that disappointment to God. Say like if one of you were called to preach and you said, no God, I can't speak, I can't do that. Or one of you were called to teach in uh, children or one of you were called to teach youth or one of you were called to teach adults and you were saying, God, I just can't do that and you would refuse to do it. It would be like the children of Israel when they came to Kadesh Barnea and they sent 12 spies into the promised land to seek it out. And when they came back, their report was the two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, Our God can help us take the land. But 10 of those spies said, Oh, the land is flowing with milk and honey, just like God said. But there's giants in the land, and we can't overtake the giants. And so if at some point in my life, along my Christian walk, I tell God no, then not only do I suffer consequences for not doing what Jesus tells me to do, but I also cause all of those whom God would use in my life to, uh, to promote the kingdom of God in theirs, they lose out too. So there are times in our Christian walk, Jesus said, or in the Bible we're told, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say work for your salvation. It says work out your own salvation. In other words, continually saying yes to God so that you move from faith to faith to faith. I should love God more now than I did when I got saved. I should have more faith in my life than now, now than whenever I got saved. And so the, the walk of Christ, the walk for the believer is a continual growth process of what God wants to do in my life. So it is this morning that I want to say to you that the way there is a time whenever we're saved, but I also believe there is a time when we respond to the call of God to do what he tells us to do, and it's over and beyond what I think I have the capacity to do. And if I say yes to God, it will be a wonderful experience and a wonderful walk with God. And I will meet many, many wonderful people. But if I say no to God, if I say no to what he's telling me to do, then there will be great sorrow and not a lot of peace along the way in that person's life. So if you would, take your Bible and turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I have preached on it numerous times uh, in numerous ways numerous outlines, uh, but this is a beautiful passage that Paul gives us about his walk with Christ and how he came to know Jesus as his personal Savior. So would you stand with me as we read this, uh, the, 20, the second chapter, the 20th verse. It says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray together. Father.
Father, I want to say thank you for your precious word and how it ministers to us and how it shows us the path of life that can be such a blessing not only to us but also to others who are around us. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, sweet Holy Spirit, please move in my life today that I might speak with such clarity that everyone under the sound of my voice would understand what you're saying to us by the word of God. And then, Lord, I pray for the courage. I pray for the strength of those who may have said no to you in the past that they would say yes to you today. Or, God, for those who have said yes to you in the past, they would be encouraged to say yes to you in the future. We love you, God, and we thank you for letting us be here today to worship and to serve you. Touch us with your spirit, we pray by your word. Amen and amen. You may be seated. What in the world was Paul talking about when he said, I am crucified with Christ? We know that Jesus was crucified. We know that he was born to die. In his passion, Jesus was mocked. Jesus was flogged. Jesus was nailed to the cross. Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth, between God and Satan. He was, he was lamb-blasted by the religious crowd. The religious leaders castigated him. The Roman soldiers were contemptuous toward him. And even the thief on the cross taunted him as he was hanging there suspended between heaven and earth. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. What does he mean when he says, I am crucified with Christ? Was he crucified? Was he mocked? Was he, was he nailed on the cross? Did he suffer shame and disgrace when he was nailed to the cross? Did he suffer those nails in his hands and his feet? Did he suffer by the mockery of all those who would look upon him and taunt him and lamb blast him and speak contemptuously toward him? I want to say to you today that that's not exactly what Paul, the Apostle Paul, is talking about when he says, I am crucified with Christ. He's not talking about being physically upon the cross. He's talking about being crucified, that his life is put to death. The life that he has lived, he put that life to death. So let's look at that life for just a minute. We find that Paul was raised in Jerusalem. He moved to Jerusalem as just a little tyke, and he began to love the law of God, and he also began to love the temple. He began to love the priesthood, and so therefore he began to study the word of God. He began to memorize the word of God as every Jewish boy would, the Torah. And so we find, too, that as he grew, he became a student under Rabbi Gamaliel, which was an awesome teacher of that day. So this teacher took him and he taught him all about the law. And so Paul became a zealous student of the word. Before his name was Paul, he was called Saul. And so Saul had moved to Jerusalem. Saul had studied the word of God. Saul had become a student of the word of God under Gamaliel. And now Saul was hearing that there was something taking place. There was some person that people were talking about. His name was Jesus. They were called Christians. And he was very upset that they were coming against the Jewish faith and the Jewish religion. So he became zealous about doing away with these people who were talking and taunting the word of God. Would you take your Bible and turn with me to Acts chapter 9? And I want you to see the anger and the zealousness with which Paul sought to kill those who were trusting Jesus as their personal Savior. To have those put in prison, behind prison bars, those who would follow Jesus. In Acts chapter 9... We read about Paul's conversion, but before that conversion, we read in verse 1, and it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slander against all the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Would you listen to those words? Listen to what it says. Breathing out threatenings and slaughter 
against the disciples of the Lord. I want to say to you that this was a zealot that was ready to do anything and everything he could do that would stop this ridiculous movement about those Christians who would follow the Lord. And so he goes to the high priest because of his zealousness and because of his desire for this movement to stop and this movement to perish. And this is what the high priest does. Verse 2. He desired of the high priest letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, and if he found any of this way, what he's talking about, any believers who trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He was ready to put all of these people to death because of their heresy and their hypocrisy. The Bible says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined about, round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? We find that even though Saul had dedicated his life, dedicated his life to the zealousness of the word and the destruction of what was called the way or the church, now we find him going to Damascus and something happens to him on the road to Damascus. Now then, Paul says in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. What did he mean by that statement when he was not physically crucified on the cross? What was Paul doing? Paul had a zealousness to destroy the church. Paul had a zealousness toward the word of God. Paul had a goal in his life to allow the word of God to be in his life. He was a religious man, but he was religiously lost in the fact that he worshipped the created instead of the creator. So here we find in chapter 7 about the climax of what's about to happen. What does Paul do? So what I want to say to you today is, what did Paul mean by being, I am crucified with Christ? He says, what he means is that his life was put to death. The cross was a way of death. It was a persecution. And death was certain for all of those who would hang there upon the cross. So what the Apostle Paul is saying is that he came to the place in his life where his old life was put to death. In other words, he put his old goals, he put his old life, he put his old purpose, he put his old desires, he put his old accomplishments, he put his old life on the cross of Calvary so that it would perish and no more have influence on him because it was not the way of God. It was not the way of God. It was what he wanted in his life. It was what he was zealous in doing. But even in doing all of this that he was zealous about, he was trying to do away with Jesus. And when Jesus reveals himself to Saul... He becomes the Apostle Paul. Paul put to death on that day, Paul put to death his purpose for destroying the church. Paul put to death his goals for advancing in the religion of Judaism. Paul put to death the accomplishments that he had made as far as his study in religions and all that. Paul put to death his life. And in exchange, in exchange of putting to death these things in his life, he received the Christ life. Do you hear what I'm saying? He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. What did he mean by that? What he means by that is he didn't physically go to the cross. He took his will and he put his will on the cross. The will to do whatever he wanted. The will to do wherever he wanted to go. Whatever he wanted to become. He put it on the cross. 
but it did not kill him. It did not kill his personality. It did not kill who he was. But now he has a new God in his life, not what he wants anymore, but by what God wants because he says, I am crucified with Christ. My will is dead. My will to do what I want is gone. And now I support a new meaning for my life, a new purpose for my life, and that is found in Jesus the Christ who was crucified for him. Paul came to the point in his life where he realized that what he was doing by word of God, what he was doing was not of God. And Paul, Saul repented and God took him and taught him for two years out in the desert what the word of God really meant. And all that study that Paul had done in the past, God found the fruition of that study in Jesus the Christ. The Lord, whom Paul says was crucified for him, loved him so much that he was willing to die for him him. So this morning, every one of us are different places in our walk with Christ. Every one of us are different areas in the different areas of growth. But I want to tell you that if you ever do anything in the life of the kingdom of God, you're going to go through this experience of dying to yourself and being alive to God. Dying, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What he is saying is that whatever God calls me to do, I am going to follow him. Second Corinthians tells us that, G, that the Apostle Paul was beaten five times with 39 lashes. These executioners were so... Uh, so schooled in their punishment and their execution that the 49th lash would bring death. Paul, was, Paul received this execution five different times. He was shipwrecked. He was left alone at night in the ocean of a day and a night. My goodness, uh, my goodness, what was God calling him to do and calling him to be? But the beautiful thing is that he had died to his own self to be alive to whatever God wanted, and as a result... He became a witness not only to those people of that day, but he's a witness to you and to me of this day as well. What an awesome testimony of one man who was willing to say yes to God when he came to the point where it was either him or God. He chose God. I believe in our Christian walk. I believe there are times whenever God brings us to that point. I want to share with you mine today. I was saved when I was 10 years old. In August, I was saved at a little, a little uh, mission. Matter of fact, the preacher took me to the little Sunday school room, and he shared with me about Christ, and I prayed to receive Christ right there in that Sunday school room. During the worship service, we were worshiping in an old Quonson hut. That's about a half moon tin building with uh, sawdust on the floor and fold-up chairs and a little bitty stage for, the, for where the preacher would stand. And I remember when he stood up to give the invitation, I couldn't get down there quick enough to tell everybody that Jesus had come into my heart. And then I was baptized at a, at a fellow Baptist church. But I want to tell you, my desire was to follow Jesus. I didn't always do exactly what Jesus wanted me to do, and there were cer certainly sins in my life. But I do know that God called me to preach. And I wanted to be the best preacher that I could be. Do you hear what I'm saying? I wanted to be the best preacher I could be. I wanted to be the best pastor I could be. I wanted to be the best leader of the church that I could be. God called us to go to seminary down in New Orleans. We left seminary and went to Belzona, Mississippi, the heart of the Delta. I've told you some about that story. We went to the cab where we experienced some good things. We went to uh, Ecru where... Uh, from DeKalb, we went to Ecru, and we were at Ecru about three years, and during that time, there were some really situations that arose up in the life of the church, and some difficult situations, and so I felt like that the Lord was calling me to resign that church, and, uh, and just see where God was going to take us. 
It was in October of the year. And I remember, uh, I didn't know where we were going to go. I didn't know what we were going to do. And this little woman in the community who was a member of our church group, uh, our senior adult group, came to us and said, look, I've got a house out here in the country. If y'all would like to move out here into the country, we'd love for you to come move out there with us. So that's what we did. Here we go. Two little children, a wife and a wife and a husband who felt like God called them to preach but was serving, had served in the first church where I had a staff and it seemed like I was a failure. It seemed like things didn't go well at all. And I remember I was driving to Jackson for a minister's conference. And I remember on the way to Jackson, I had, an old black, I had a black Ford Ranger. I was going down 55 Highway. And I remember I got so overcome with the failure. Anybody ever been there? So overcome with the failure in my life of trying to do what God wanted me to do and try to preach like God wanted me to preach and try to lead the church like God wanted me to lead the church. And I remember I was so overcome with tears that, that I just had to pull off the side of the road because I couldn't drive anymore. I opened the door and I got out of the truck and I walked up this little hill and there was a tree that had fallen and I sat down on that tree. And I began to weep before the Lord. I said, Lord, this is what you called me to do. This is where you called me to be. And now I've made a million failure and a mess of things. And this is for a preacher just to quit with no place to go. It could be vocational suicide. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because who wants a reject? <laughs> Hello? So I was sitting there and I was I was praying and I was crying out to the Lord. And this passage of scripture came to my mind. Lord, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I stood up. And I realized where I was standing. I was sitting on a tree that had fallen across the hill. And underneath it, there was a tree that had fallen down the hill. And I was standing in the crook of the cross. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, It's not what you can do for me. It's what I can do. I think every believer has to come to the point in their life where I am crucified with Christ. It's not me who's doing it. It is Christ who does it through me. You see, all I was doing, I was, I believe there were some good things that were done in those churches, but there wasn't done what could have been done if I had allowed Jesus to do everything he wanted to do in my life instead of trying to do it for God. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is a difference in me trying to do stuff for God than God doing stuff in me and allowing others to be blessed by what God... And I want to tell you, my preaching took a whole different method, a whole different direction. My leading took a whole different direction. And from that point, God opened up the door for me. I had left a church running 75 in Sunday school, and God opened up a door for me to go to a church that was 239 in Sunday school. My goodness, what does God... God want us to be and what God want us to do when we really realize, come, come to find out that it's not us who is doing it it is Christ who is doing it through me and when I say yes to him, he makes a difference in my life. Amen? For instance Abraham was told by God he was going to have a son and this son was going to uh, be his descendant. And that his descendants would number more than the sands of the sea or the stars of the sky. And when Abraham and Sarah were old, and they didn't think they were going to have any children. Sarah gave Abraham her handmaiden to have a son by her. Was that God's plan? 
It was her figuring out what she needed to do to do God's plan. She had a son. The handmaiden had a son. His name was Ishmael. And then later on, the real plan of God opened up where Sarah had a baby boy, and they named him Isaac. God's plan. Well, what happened between Isaac and Ishmael? It's still going on today. Would you hear me? When we try to do God's work in our own power, in our own strength, then what we do is frustrate the kingdom of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? But when I yield myself to be crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me, and it's him doing what he wants to do through me, through my personality. It's not that I cease to exist. It's that Jesus works through my personality, through my life, through my way to get his kingdom work done. So let me ask you a question this morning. When you're serving Jesus, who's doing the serving? Is Jesus serving himself through you? Or is it you trying to serve Jesus on your own? Sunday school teachers, when you're teaching a lesson, is it you trying to teach that lesson to get out all that you can? Deacon? When you're deaconing in the life of the church, is it you who is trying to do all these things? Are you allowing Christ in you to do them? Search committee. When you're searching for a new pastor for the life of this church, is it you who are trying to do these things? Or have you crucified yourselves as a committee to find out what the will of God is for the life of the church? It can make all the difference in the world between the outcome, whether I do it in the power of God or whether I do it on my own. Amen? The beautiful thing about it is that when I become a believer, I receive the Spirit of God. And I believe with all of my heart that life, that salvation is a process. And when we're working through that process, God leads us to each place. There are each stations in our life. There are marks, so to speak, in our life that says God brings us to a certain point and it causes us to have to respond by faith. And if I respond by faith, the kingdom is blessed. But if I fear and I say no to God, then God's kingdom is harmed. My life is harmed because I'm not doing, being obedient to the one who called me. Can I tell you, it is the most exciting adventure to be a believer. I saw the world this week. I saw, I saw a lot of college students this week. I saw what they didn't wear. I saw how they didn't act. I saw what they did. Beloved, listen, some of them think that's the life. But I want to tell you, when you walk with Jesus, you wake up not with a hangover, but you wake up with a joy in your heart that God has worked in you and moved in you and lived in you and brought glory to his kingdom. How wonderful a work that is from God. And when we know that we have been forgiven of all our sin, all of our sin has been placed under the blood. There is a joy in our heart. And when we have the Spirit living in us and God uses us to serve Him in some capacity, there is no greater joy than that. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you've never known what it means to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. There's shortcomings the way you've disappointed Jesus in the way you've lived your life. I want to tell you that Jesus, just like on the cross, he's standing with his arms stretched out, and he's crying unto you, Come unto me, all ye that labor, all of you that think you have a life that is filled with these kinds of things, 
Come unto me. I truly have life and joy and peace and love for you. That's what Jesus said. Amen? So if there's anyone here today who does not know Jesus as their personal Savior, today could be your day of salvation. Or if there's somebody here this morning who God brought you to a certain point in your life and you refuse to go any further, and your life has been filled with bitterness, your life is filled with no purpose, you have more fun out of the church than you do in the church because that conviction is always there. If that's the case, go back to that place and tell God you're sorry. Go back to that place that you said no to God and tell him you're sorry. And then you tell him you want to do whatever he wants to do because I have crucified my life with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me in the life which I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and who died for me. Now then, if you're a believer here today, and so far you've said yes to Jesus, then you can rejoice because Jesus has got a lot of other good things in store for you and for those around you. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. So this invitation is going to be for anyone who needs to say something to Jesus, to say, I'm sorry, or to say, thank you, Lord, or whatever it is in your life that you need to say to Jesus. If you need to be saved, then repent of your sin, cry out to Jesus, and he will save you. If you've disappointed him by saying no, then repent and say yes. God is good. And all the people said? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you today for Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. We thank you, Lord, that you allow us to experience things in our life that will grow us in our Christian walk. We're not saved as mature believers. We're saved as babies. And Lord, the process of growing comes through your word and through the experiences that you bring into our life. And Lord, if there's someone under the sound of my voice today that they feel disappointed, that they've disappointed you, that they're not right with you, Lord, today, let them know that today is the day you love them and you want them to come to you and be renewed. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us. We ask you to move during this invitation, whether it's someone needing to be saved or whether it's someone needing to move their membership or whether it's someone who needs to repent of saying no to you. Hear our prayer and move upon us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.